The king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he will. Verse 30. No wisdom, no understanding, no counsel can avail against the Lord. The horse is made ready for the day of battle, but the victory belongs to the Lord. O Lord, give us understanding that we may keep your law and observe it with the entirety of our hearts. For it's in Jesus we pray. Amen. Would you please be seated? <clears throat> Did you know the United States once had an emperor? His name was Joshua A. Norton. He lived in San Francisco during the gold rush days of the 1800s. He was a colorful character, to say the least. When speculation in the rice market brought him to financial ruin, something happened to Norton's mind. He declared himself emperor of these United States. Norton's pretending soon grew into a delusion. In 1859, he published a proclamation that he was emperor according to an act of the California legislature. He found a sword, stuck a plume in his hat, found a cape, and marched the streets in colorful costume. The citizens of San Francisco were amused by this ploy, so they played the game with him. They gave him recognition with free tickets to special events, he was invited to gala opening nights. They allowed him to collect a small tax and issued his own currency. And by the way, if you ever come across a Norton dollar, hang on to it. It's worth more than $10,000 today. It was all done in the spirit of fun, but to Norton, it was serious business. In fact, he expanded his authority to emperor of these United States and protector of Mexico. When he died in 1880, more than 10,000 curious people attended Norton's funeral service. He lived and died in his own delusion of grandeur. He didn't hurt anyone. In fact, he brought a bit of a smile and a chuckle to people who came across his path. Could it be that we too live in the delusion of our own self-importance and self-exaltation? Do we believe that people owe us admiration and allegiance? I think of King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. One night he was walking on the roof of his palace. And these are the words that he spoke to himself. He said, is not this great Babylon, which I have built by my mighty power as a royal residence and for the glory of my majesty? At that very moment, Nebuchadnezzar was driven from his kingdom to dwell among the beasts of the earth. He ate grass like an ox. His hair grew as long as eagle's feathers, and his nails became like bird's claws. So we learn that self-exaltation dehumanizes us as, so that we live like the beast of the earth. There was also the sense that Nebuchadnezzar lost his ability to reason and think clearly. In short, he lost his mind. But King Nebuchadnezzar learned his lesson. He had a change of heart. Here is Nebuchadnezzar's confession, and it is one of the most glorious in all of Scripture. In Daniel chapter 4, we read, <clears throat> At the end of days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up my eyes to heaven, and my reason returned to me. And I blessed the Most High and praised and honored Him who lives forever. For His dominion is an everlasting dominion, and His kingdom endures 
<clears throat> from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing. And he does according to his will among the host of heaven. And among the inhabitants of the earth, none can stay his hand or say to him, What have you done? Let us not live in the delusion of our own self-importance. There is one who is greater still, and to him we must bow and owe our allegiance. God is our rightful king. What are the characteristics of God's kingship? This is what we shall consider in our sermon today. How should we understand God's reign? There will be two points. First, the king of kings. And secondly, a different kind of king. And so under the heading, the king of kings, we will look at the characteristics of God's reign that come from the Proverbs that we have just read. And the first characteristic of God's reign is that the will of the Lord prevails. The will of the Lord prevails. Proverbs chapter 21, verse 1. The king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he will. The king's heart is compared to water, which is easily manipulated and diverted. Unlike rigid materials such as diamonds or steel beams or concrete blocks, water can be diverted by canals, dams, new river channels, weirs, culverts, pipes, swales, gutter systems, drains, and, many, and in many other ways. So the Lord guides and turns the heart of the king as water in his hand. And we have an example of this from the scriptures. We think of King Cyrus of Persia and how God worked in his heart. Listen to these words from Ezra chapter 1, verses 1 through 2. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. So here is Cyrus. He's a pagan king. He's a Gentile king. And yet God is moving in his heart so that he will help the people of Judah build a temple in the holy city of Jerusalem. We think of John chapter 19. And Pilate is speaking to Jesus while Jesus is on trial, just hours before he's to be crucified. And Pilate said to Jesus, you will, not speak to, you will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? Jesus answered him, you would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. Consider how this verse from Proverbs applies to our lives. If God is the one directing the heart of the king, then who is really in charge? It is not the king. God is determining outcomes and results. God is guiding and directing nations according to his perfect plan and his will. I'm not really concerned about the election this fall. I'm going to vote, but on that day, after the election, I know who will be in charge. It will be the Lord. Same as today and yesterday and the day before. And so God is Lord of the hearts of those who rule. But a second characteristic we see in the Proverbs is that the nations are not a threat to God. The nations are not a threat to God. Proverbs 21, verse 30. No wisdom, no understanding, no counsel can avail against the Lord. 
the sense of this verse is that no human or worldly wisdom, understanding, or counsel can overcome or conquer the Lord. And I think immediately of Psalm 2. And in that psalm, we see the nations gathering together to oppose the Lord. And we read in Psalm 2, Why did the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed. And the nations despise God for possessing authority over them. And so their intent is to take God down. So they plot and they make plans to oppose God and to defeat Him. So what does God do? In verse 4 of that psalm we read, He who sits in the heavens laughs. In other words, they do not pose a problem for the Lord. The Father shall set His Son on His eternal throne, and He shall reign forever, and no earthly power shall ever be able to stand against Him. Think of Isaiah chapter 40. What a great chapter that is in the Bible, showing God's majesty and His power. Isaiah 40 says, Behold, the nations are like a drop from a bucket and are accounted as the dust on the scales. Behold, he takes up the coastlands like fine dust. All the nations are as nothing before him. They are accounted by him as less than nothing and emptiness. It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who brings princes to nothing and makes the rulers of the earth as emptiness. No one can effectively oppose our Lord who is king. And then the final characteristic is that the victory belongs to the Lord. Proverbs 21, verse 31. The horse is made ready for the day of battle, but the victory belongs to the Lord. In 1 Kings chapter 20, the Israelites defeated the Syrians in the hills. So the Syrians said that the reason Israel defeated them was because their God was Lord of the hills, but not of the valleys. So the Syrians chose to fight against Israel in the valleys. 1 Kings chapter 20, verse 27 says, The people of Israel encamped before them like two little flocks of goats. But the Syrians filled the country. The Syrians believed that because they had, a, had superior numbers and they were fighting against Israel in the valleys, that they were assured of victory. I wonder how the Lord felt about being called God of the hills and not of the valleys. When the battle was joined, the Israelites struck down a hundred thousand Syrian foot soldiers and they were in panicked retreat. And then a wall of the city of Aphek fell upon another 27,000 Syrian soldiers and they were badly defeated. It seems that God is Lord of the valleys as well as the hills. The victory of the Lord does not depend upon a superior fighting force or the location of the battle or who has the most chariots or which army is better trained and disciplined. 1 Samuel chapter 14 verse 6 says, For nothing can hinder the Lord from saving by many or by few. So let's review. First, the Lord sovereignly directs the hearts of all kings and heads of state. God determines their courses. Secondly, the nations cannot successfully oppose the living God. As Martin Luther said in his hymn, God is a bulwark never failing. The enemy always stands conquered before God. Thirdly, 
Even good outcomes are credited to the Lord and not to human planning, strength, or discipline. God deserves all the glory. God is king over the hearts of all rulers. God is king over the plans of the enemy. God is king over all outcomes. I think of Psalm chapter 115, verse 3. Our God is in the heavens. He does all that He pleases. This means that God is never hindered or delayed. His plans are never suspended or obstructed. He accomplishes all that is in His heart to fulfill. God never asks permission or says please to His creatures that He has formed. He does not do whatever pleases humanity or what he and man decide together. The reign of God is absolute. It is absolute. But I think the difficulty for us is this. Since God's reign is absolute, then who would want to serve this divine king of all this power and magnitude. We would most readily withdraw from him than to come near to him and be in relationship with him. And so we come to the second point, a different kind of king. Imagine being the beloved son or daughter of some powerful king or emperor your relationship with the king would be very different than those who are citizens in his realm. In Scripture, God is not portrayed as an oppressive tyrant or a cruel, exacting judge. He is not a God who demands that we continually prove ourselves in order to be accepted and counted as worthy. We may assume that we live under his rule and protection, but we may still feel distant and removed from our God with no warmth of relationship. And this is why many are not interested in drawing near to God in faith. Because they perceive God as sometimes angry, sometimes impatient, sometimes moody, sometimes disappointed. They look at him as this stern and strict authoritarian. In Michael Reeves' book, Delighting in the Trinity, he describes the, for, the reformer Martin Luther, who as a monk, he saw God as one who is righteous and one who hated sin, but he failed to understand anything beyond this about God. This is what Luther said. As a monk, he said, I did not love, yes, I hated the righteous God who punishes sinners and secretly, if not blasphemously, certainly murmuring greatly, I was angry with God. Prior to his conversion to faith in Christ, Martin Luther did not know God as a kind and willing father a God who invites us into a close, intimate relationship with Him. Luther was of the opinion that he could not love this cold-hearted God. And this is why many in the medieval church prayed to Mary and the saints because they thought that those saints who had passed on into glory were more understanding and sympathetic than to approach this holy God whom they feared. But then, as Reeves writes, that changes when Luther began to see that God is a fatherly God who shares, who gives to us his righteousness, glory, and wisdom. As Luther reflected back at his days as a monk, he realized that he had actually been worshiping the wrong God and not the true God. 
Luther realized that it is not enough to know God only as creator, judge, and ruler. We must also know him as loving father. Luther wrote in his large catechism, we may look into his fatherly heart and sense how boundlessly he loves us. That would warm our hearts setting them aglow with thankfulness. And this is what is true for every believer, that in Christ's redemptive work, we are given the full rights of adoption. And then God sends His Holy Spirit into us that we now have the heart of adoption by which we cry out, Abba, Father. And we come to know the Father's love for us. God is a different kind of king. Listen to Psalm 10. The Lord is king forever and ever. The nations perish from his land. O Lord, you hear the desire of the afflicted. You will strengthen their heart. You will incline your ear to do justice to the fatherless and the oppressed so that man who is of the earth may strike terror no more. So there's a very different kind of picture of God as king who's protecting the helpless and the orphan and the widow and who inclines his ear to hear and shows compassion and mercy. Here is a benevolent king, merciful and gracious. Dutch theologian Herman Bovik said it well, God's will is one with his being, his wisdom, his goodness, and all his other perfections. For that reason, the human heart and head can rest in that will, for it is the will of an almighty God and a gracious Father. Not that of a blind fate, incalculable chance, or a dark force of nature. His sovereignty is one of unlimited power, but also of wisdom and grace. He is both king and father at one and the same time. This is the kind of God and king that we can draw near to and we can place our trust in. There's an old Roman story which tells how a Roman emperor once enjoyed a great victory. And he was returning to the capital city and leading his troops. And behind his troops were the trophies of his victory, his prisoners. And the streets were lined with people cheering. And there were legionnaires lining the streets to make sure the crowd didn't come into the streets to keep everything calm and orderly. And as the parade and the emperor reached the platform where the empress was and the emperor's family, the son of the emperor wanted to go see a daddy. And so he jumped off the platform, made it through the crowd, but he couldn't make it past the legionnaire. The legionnaire picked him up in his arms. And the legionnaire said to the little boy, you can't do that. Don't you know who that is in the chariot? That is the emperor. You can't run out to his chariot. The little lad looked at the legionnaire and said, he may be your emperor, but he is my father. He is my father. God is both king and father to those who are in Christ Jesus. And we can give thanks to God's fatherly love, his mercy, and his grace. Let us pray. Lord, our king and our father, forgive us when we seek to exalt self, And then ignore the glory and honor that is due your name. 
Forgive us when we assume that earthly rulers and governments are determining outcomes and we forget that you alone are sovereign ruler. You are king over human hearts, over enemy plans, and over all outcomes. O oh Lord, let us rest in your reign. We thank you that you are not a king who is cruel, evil, or oppressive. We give thanks that you are kind, caring, and benevolent. We give thanks that in Jesus, your son, we can call you Father. O oh Lord, let us draw near to delight in you and to know you as our refuge. You are blessed and holy. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Please uh, turn with me to hymn number 356, I Know Whom I Have Believed. Let us stand together. <laughs> 